Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Big Data Beyond Hadoop discussion. Uh, my name is Nikolai Bakachev, Solutions Architect with AWS Worldwide Public Sector. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to be with you today and also to share the stage uh, with Marco Merens from ICAO, uh, which is our organization, uh, part of the United Nations. And uh, Marco will be giving a specific example of uh, using big data beyond Hadoop to solve some uh, real world uh, aviation safety uh, statistics uh, problems. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, will big data scale to infinity? And uh, I suspect you, you, you kind of uh, can guess the answer here. Uh, and then how does AWS remove the constraints towards that big data growth? Hadoop in the cloud, advantages, strengths, and limitations. And we'll look at the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, Amazon Redshift for real-time analytics and our partners from the AWS marketplace. And finally, AWS big data workflow automation. And of course, we have the best for last where Marco will share some specific examples. So before we dive in, uh, may I ask uh, who uh, is using EMR today here in the audience? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I think about half of, of the audience. And how about Redshift? Terrific, terrific. So hopefully after this discussion, we'll have even, even more users. And I certainly encourage you all uh, to present here next year your successes uh, with big data on AWS. Uh, one last question. Who is ready for the replay party tonight? Come on, everybody. OK. So let's get started quickly. Um, we all experience big data in our daily life, no question about it. We're part of the explosion of big data from uh, social media to email overloads to actually collecting data with our health, personal health monitors. But the impact is even greater on the enterprise. And this is one of our customers. The International Center for Radio Astronomy Research is based in Australia. And it's part of an international consortium building the square kilometer array the biggest radio telescope in the world, at least in the known universe. So one day, once they go live into production in a couple of years, SK, uh, the, the uh, square kilometer array, will be collecting more data every single day than the entire world is collecting today. Think about it. This is zettabytes of data every day. And they will be using AWS and crowdsource CPUs to analyze 400 to 500 galaxies simultaneously. Talk about big data. Uh, our customers range from mobile, cable telecom, oil, gas, and infrastructure, industrial manufacturing to retail, no surprise there, uh, Amazon.com and many others. Life sciences, as we heard in the keynote uh, discussions yesterday, financial services, uh, publishing and media, and last but, but not least, online media, social networking, and gaming. If your organization is not listed here, Chances are, whether it's an academic institution, government department, or, or a corporation, you are still also dealing with big data, both the challenges and the opportunities. So will it really scale to infinity? Well, it seems both Gartner and IDC agree. And they've estimated the growth of uh, big data to be at 62% uh, uh, compound annual growth. Before this presentation, I was checking uh, our big data presentations from two years ago. And back then, we reported 40% growth. Today, we're reporting 62% growth. In other words, the growth is only accelerating. So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is this growing gap between the generated data and data available for analysis. And that's where we believe AWS can really help you remove constraints. We love scalability. Uh, in almost every session, you hear about that. Uh, you can easily scale to thousands of instances, run them for an hour or two, and shut them down. Obviously, much more cost effective than investing in fixed infrastructure that you, you're committed to run for long periods of time. So there's zero upfront capital. All services are on demand, elastic, and very scalable all the way to thousands and tens of thousands of machines, as you've heard here at uh, reInvent and you pay only for what you, what, you lose, uh, what you use. So how does that apply specifically to the big data constraints? The famous three Vs, uh, the volume, variety, and velocity of big data. And uh, I would focus on specifically on the velocity here. 
this is not only the accumulation of big data, the rate of accumulation, but also the rate of change. The formats of data change, the sources of data change, our analytic choices and tools to process that data change, both from the open source community and the commercial software community. And finally, the important thing about big data is what matters is really the final results, the time to final results until you can benefit from your big data insights. It's not really the performance of any single tool in the big data pipeline. And that's where AWS comes in to help re address these constraints. Virtually unlimited resources, uh, I'm sure you heard a lot about that uh, here at reInvent, a variety of compute solutions, and we'll review some of them, including Hadoop and Redshift. Iterative experimental deployment of your infrastructure to, make, uh, to match the character of your big data tasks. And last but not least, getting you to faster results by deploying only the infrastructure that you need in a flexible parallel environment where multiple projects can go in parallel and when they're down, you can just shut them down. So what is the tool that helps you do that? We believe there's no one tool to rule them all. It's really a variety of tools. AWS has released over 40 tools over our history. Even here at reInvent, we released several. Today, our focus is really on the analytics tools, specifically around Hadoop and data warehousing being Redshift, and of course, our foundation services, compute storage, security, and networking. So how do we offer Hadoop in the cloud? We call it Amazon EMR, or Amazon Elastic MapReduce. And what that is, is a fully managed Hadoop service. It's based on Apache Hadoop. It runs the Hadoop distributed file system. Uh, it runs the latest version of Hadoop 2 uh, in, uh, running on Yarn. And it runs the MapReduce parallel processing uh, framework. Now, in addition to that, we offer you special cases of using S3 instead, or in addition to HDFS, and other tools which I'll be discussing a bit uh, later. Courtesy to our customers and partners at Netflix, this is uh, from their blog, this is the foundation infrastructure of their Hadoop uh, on, on the cloud deployment. And actually, for those of you who uh, saw our yesterday's presentation, I'm glad to say this is still the core of their environment on EMR, and they continue to add various components to it, open source components, etc. The key points here, the foundation is really S3. So S3 is your data hub in the cloud. Highly resilient, highly durable, and also allowing optimal parallel I.O. On top of that, you can start as many Hadoop clusters or EMR clusters as you, as you wish or as you need for your processing. And then on top of that, you have the Hadoop ecosystem of tools, including Hive, Pig, or general programming languages uh, like Java and Python. And then Netflix, like many other organizations, develop their own uh, BI tools on top or, or administrative and management tools, which uh, they happen to uh, make available to the community as open source tools. So I certainly encourage you to visit uh, the Netflix uh, uh, blogs on this topic. So how does EMR work? Well, it all starts with S3. So you typically upload your data in S3 somehow. Uh, you can choose to copy that data into HDFS as well or not, and we'll talk a bit more about it later. Then the next critical step is you choose your distribution. It's, uh, you have many options. It's not just the latest version, but several older versions of Hadoop. They're, maybe they're compatible with your existing code. You choose your number and type of nodes, custom configuration, tools like HivePick and many others. And most importantly, and we'll talk more about it, you can choose bootstrap actions, which are custom ways to enhance your uh, uh, cluster environment. You can launch the environment literally in minutes. And then typically the output is also in S3, or you keep it in HDFS. And there are some trade-offs. Uh, according to Netflix presentation yesterday, uh, you, you have a little bit performance degradation, 5 to 10% when you use uh, S3, but you gain the durability and also the high parallelism of potentially use several clusters uh, with the same S3 data. And then finally, you can easily scale out or scale back uh, down your cluster uh, with processing nodes as needed. 
I want to highlight only a couple of configuration points uh, on EMR. And this is the management console interface. You have access to all these tools through the command line or through the APIs. Number one, the variety of distributions. Not only of Apache Hadoop, which uh, come from uh, Amazon or AWS, but also MapR distributions. And hopefully in the future, we'll have other uh, distributions available at EMR. In addition, with a single uh, button click, you can select applications like HivePick, HBase, Impala, Ganglia. Today, we heard during the keynote from Splunk uh, about the Hunk application, which you'll be able to deploy. And also, Hue was recently deployed, also an ap application available to you on EMR. You have general purpose programming languages. You have languages like Mahout and R, and we'll uh, dive deeper into that. Uh, one point on the EMR file system, another uh, recent capability of EMR. The key is that you can manage your cons consistent view of your S3 objects uh, because we uh, manage metadata of your S3 objects in DynamoDB. And of course, you can also do encryption, and you learned about our new encryption services, which uh, you can benefit from on EMR. And then finally, the bootstrap actions uh, which can uh, give you a lot of flexibility what you can do uh, on EMR. So what is Hadoop, uh, Hadoop really well suited for? It's really the best tool for, for basic statistics. In other words, counting items, uh, summaries, uh, averages, means, etc. Even in this area, though, which is highly uh, parallelized, Hadoop does not have by itself a package for statistical computation. So that's where we'll talk about the potential extension with R and how you can leverage the capabilities of R together with the parallelism of Hadoop. Now, what are the areas where Hadoop is not really that, that, that good at or, or not that suitable? Number one is when these parallel data slip, uh, splits, when they have inherent dependencies, uh, then all of a sudden you cannot benefit uh, so well from this uh, parallelism of Hadoop. And typical examples are machine learning problems. And that's where we'll give you the example about uh, Mahout, one of many options that you have to explore uh, with Hadoop. And then finally, iterative computation. By definition, MapReduce is a batch processing job consisting of a mapper and a reducer. And then after that, data gets stored on disk. So clearly, if you have multiple iterations, they all have to go through disks, which slows down the process significantly. Graph computing is, is one area where this would affect performance, and that's where we'll talk about Jira. So let's briefly look at the uh, Apache Hadoop ecosystem, which has evolved over the years to complement the core MapReduce process. This is by no means an exhaustive view. I certainly encourage you to keep exploring various uh, tools, but just to give you a flavor of the environment. Number one, these are the core components of Hadoop. Uh, I included Nudge here as the original web uh, crawler project from which Hadoop was a spin-off. And then, of course, uh, HDFS, MapReduce, uh, Pig and Hive as the analytics tools, Triff and Cascading for building interfaces. Uh, you have a, a rich tool set of streaming tools like uh, Avro or uh, SQL uh, interfaces with Scoop or data collection engines like Flume or Chukwa. A very active open source community around Hadoop is NoSQL databases, uh, HBase, Accumulo, they run on Hadoop. In fact, you can launch them on EMR. Uh, Cassandra is not per se part of the Hadoop ecosystem, but it's very often used together and in parallel with Hadoop. And then finally, Zookeeper uh, is a, a very uh, popular tool used by uh, NoSQL databases, used also by, G by Giraffe to coordinate distributed systems. Spark and TES, two very new technologies. I certainly encourage you to explore further. Uh, they were mentioned at some of the presentations here in reInvent. Uh, in fact, Netflix was experimenting with, uh, with TES. These are alternatives to MapReduce. Uh, they uh, actually execute a directed uh, acyclic graph instead of the standard mapper reducer. Then you can define a variety of execution modes and therefore run them in memory and, and then be more efficient. Uh, and then finally, the topic of today's discussion, 
the extension of Hadoop with R for statistical computing, with Mahal for machine learning, and uh, with Giraffe from, uh, for um, uh, graph processing. All of these projects, just want to hi highlight, almost all of them are part of the uh, Apache uh, ecosystem. A couple of them are open source, but part of different ecosystems like uh, Cascading and R. So let's talk first about uh, statistical processing with R. How many of you are familiar with R or maybe using it today? Wonderful, wonderful, terrific. So uh, uh, really a majority of the audience. It's, it's the most popular uh, statistical processing tool. Uh, and it's, uh, it uses a mixture of paradigms, a very powerful tool. The challenge with R is that originally it was designed based on uh, statistical uh, languages from the 70s. It was really designed to work on a, sing on a single machine. So analysts were limited to what their machine can, uh, can handle in terms of processing power, memory, etc. Hadoop gives you a path to run R in parallel and therefore increase the size of the task you can process. So how can you do that? In fact, R is already installed on every single EMR node. So it's already there. Now, how can you run it in parallel then? The easiest way is to leverage the Hadoop streaming library, and many of you are probably familiar with it, uh, in which all you need to do is to write a mapper and write a reducer code in R, and then submit them as parameters to your uh, Hadoop streaming uh, request, and then they will run in parallel and produce your data uh, back to you. We have, uh, by the way, uh, this described in our big data blog, and I'll be coming back to this big uh, data blog uh, uh, again in the presentation. Certainly encourage you to visit AWS big data blog. Uh, a slight upgrade on this approach is still based on, on Hadoop streaming, uh, but it's in a more uh, uh, R user-friendly format. Are the libraries or the project packages by Revolution Analytics uh, as part of R Hadoop? To run R Hadoop, you would need to download the packages, install them on your EMR cluster, and then this will allow you to define your entire uh, Hadoop job more in R terms instead of writing in directly in Hadoop streaming. Uh, we have that also well described in great detail in our big data blog. I certainly encourage you to visit that. It's certainly another capability for running R on, uh, on EMR available to you. And in addition, you can install uh, the R Studio server uh, for interactive uh, visualization and manipulation. Next, let's talk about machine learning. As distinct from R, Mahout was developed as a Hadoop Java application or Java library for machine learning to begin with. So it's even easier to run it on EMR. Uh, the library is already installed on the EMR nodes. Uh, you have actually uh, algorithms provided for uh, collaborative filtering. And we're all familiar with that. If we buy online books or uh, watch movies, etc. We always get recommendations, and that's typically based on uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, libraries for clustering or unsupervised learning, and typically that's uh, about grouping data, let's say grouping new stories uh, or, or, or similar other uh, unsupervised statistics based on common parameters. And then finally, finally classification or supervised learning. And again, we're all probably familiar with that in terms of spam filtering. Uh, we know those spam filtering engines, they typically are trained on, on what is considered spam and what is not, and they identify certain phrases or capitalization or other features, and then they can recognize um, what is valid email and what is uh, spam. So how do you, do, uh, how do you run Mahout on EMR? Very easy. All you need to do is really upload your data, uh, typically in S3, or any custom application that you built in Java based on, uh, based on the Mahout library. And then you can uh, really trigger uh, the required Mahout algorithms in EMR uh, as you would run any, any, any jar uh, on EMR. And these are some examples, both from our blog. I certainly encourage you to visit. I believe this blog was posted from our partners by Accenture. 
And I certainly encourage you to submit any of your uh, successes uh, with AWS technology in big data to, to our blog as well. Uh, or you can visit also the example from uh, uh, Pachi Mahout on, uh, uh, on the news groups filtering. Finally, Apache Giraffe. I kept this one for last. It's probably the most interesting application, just given the size, if nothing else. Uh, it was developed by Yahoo as an open source project. Uh, it was based on uh, Google Pregel uh, article years ago, which uh, Google leveraged uh, for page rank. So right there, this uh, is probably can uh, catch your attention. Uh, Facebook has publicized their use of Giraffe over their entire friendship graph. So we're talking uh, upwards of a billion uh, vertices here and upwards of 100 billion edges. I certainly encourage you to explore that link. It's uh, here on the, on the presentation, and you'll have access to it. So what's the essence? The essence is really a bulk synchronous parallel machine, which is really based on the algorithms from the point of view of a single vertex. And, and how they receive data signals from other vertices and then pass it through to, to, uh, to the next layer. And then Zookeeper enforces uh, these atomic barrier, uh, barriers between execution. And I have a, a, a little uh, animation here to kind of show you how in parallel all these vertices are calculated and the entire state moves very fast. It's executed in memory typically. So right off the bat, you can see how MapReduce is probably not the best fit here. So uh, how did the Giraffe developers uh, leverage uh, Hadoop uh, to execute uh, Giraffe? Well, really, they first developed it for Hadoop 1 and then for Hadoop 2. On Hadoop 1, I, they actually implemented this as one single mapper. So the entire processing was happening in one single mapper. With Hadoop 2 or Yarn, uh, actually, it's a custom implementation that uh, leverages resource management from Yarn. So basically, you launch your cluster, you configure Apache Zookeeper, and then you download one of the versions of, uh, of Giraffe. I, I picked and I've, I've tried this one. You certainly can explore uh, uh, the Giraffe Apache website for that. And then uh, you uh, run the Giraffe jar on Amazon EMR. Again, uh, very similar to Mahout, except you would have to install it. So this is just a, a, an overview of a, of a few technologies that complement Hadoop in areas where the Hadoop is not necessarily the strongest uh, framework uh, to use. This is not to exclude tools like Tez or Spark uh, or Shark on Spark or a variety of other tools, which uh, you're welcome to explore in the ecosystem. Uh, the purpose is really to, to highlight the capability of EMR to run all these tools. So where does Redshift and, and business intelligence fit in here? Well, imagine you produce your statistics uh, and, and you want to distribute the data, you want to do some real-time analysis. R maybe gives you some single-user tools for that, and, and that's terrific. Uh, but if you want to distribute it to entire enterprise, share with the with the wider community, you probably need real-time analytics with your familiar BI tools. And that's where Redshift comes in. And we had great presentations here at reInvent about Redshift. I want to highlight just two points. First of all is the leader node. And the leader node speaks PostgreSQL. It's, it's not complete language, but it's very close to complete. And then it manages your metadata and, and, and coordinates your queries. And then you have the compute nodes, which are highly distributed all the way to 128 nodes. And those nodes, they, took, they can input data and store data in parallel to S3, from S3. They can interact with DynamoDB, EMR, Kinesis. So how do you typically, and how do our customers typically leverage uh, Redshift? Well, once you have your Redshift cluster with your uh, data, which is easily uploadable from EMR or from S3, you can appoint uh, all your current analytic tools, and that's just a subset of them. We keep adding uh, new partners that support Redshift uh, via the JDBC or ODBC connector. What is the best tool to get those to, uh, to? What's the best way to get those tools? Well, we have the AWS Marketplace. How many of you are using Marketplace today? I hope many. Uh, it's a very established service. 
Uh, we have uh, almost 2,000 products there. Not surprisingly, BI tools are some of the most popular, along with security and networking tools. And uh, basically, you can start an uh, EC2 instance with the tool of choice, and licensing is either bring your own license or, or by the hour, and you can start doing analytics right away. As an example, uh, and as a segue to Margo's presentation, MongoDB is available in the marketplace. So let's say you may want to use a NoSQL database, uh, which is not HBase or it's not DynamoDB, and you like uh, Mongo for its document management features. You can easily uh, start it from the marketplace, uh, look at the uh, reference architecture that we offer, even launch the AWS CloudFront uh, to implement it uh, immediately in AWS. Uh, final product example, Cloudera, Enterprise Data Hub. Uh, we often get the question, hey, um, what, about, what if I want to like, uh, run Hadoop, uh, the Cloudera version, the Cloudera distribution? You can absolutely certainly do that on AWS. Uh, in fact, we have a cloud formation quick start for you to enable you. Uh, Cloudera fully supports uh, Enterprise Data Hub on AWS, including Cloudera Director and Cloudera Manager, and they provide also reference architectures and best practices. So finally, uh, big data workflow. So typically, after you get your data to S3, and that could be either by shipping hard drives or using S3 uh, uploads, or through our networking products like B uh, uh, VPN or Direct Connect, you may have also some AWS sources of data, like uh, RDS, Glacier, archive data, or live streaming data from Kinesis. The point is, typically, all of this data has to go into S3 as your data hub, and then from there you can leverage EMR, you can leverage other custom EC2 implementations or DynamoDB, and final analysis is typically in Redshift. So real quickly, how does this end-to-end -end workflow look like? The sources could be your data center, they could be in the AWS cloud, or they could be public sources, like Marco will be discussing in, in the aviation space. Once you collect your data in S3, you can do some ETL work in EMR. You can do analytical and uh, BI uh, processing in, in Redshift or, or DynamoDB as you need to. We provide the automation tools of simple workflow and data pipeline. And I'm not going to go in detail, but we had presentations on those topics. Suffice to say, uh, simple workflow gives you deep programmatic capabilities for parallel workflows uh, with coordination and rollbacks. And data pipeline is, is optimized. It's based on, uh, on simple workflow capabilities, but it's optimized for moving data. And it's more UI driven as opposed to programmatic. And then finally, you can leverage uh, ODBC, JDBC to Redshift or through Hive or, or Shark uh, over EMR clusters uh, to visualize data within your data centers or outside within AWS. You can certainly replace some of the components with open source tools we discussed, MongoDB uh, or, or uh, Cloudera distribution. And actually, this leads me to the architecture very similar to what uh, Marco has used uh, which consists of data collection from public data into S3, leveraging EMR and MongoDB, and Node.js. Uh, the conclusion of my part, big data is really accelerating exponentially. AWS helps you address the three Vs. It's easy to extend EMR as Hadoop in the cloud, and Redshift gives you uh, actionable real-time analytics, and AWS provides an agile big data platform. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, thank you, Nikolai. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Marco Merens. I work for for ICAO. It's a aviation a civil aviation organization of the UN. So uh, I work there in the uh, safety and efficiency business unit. So we were pretty busy this year, like with these Malaysian accidents, you know, these things. Uh, everybody's saying, oh, how it's possible you lose a plane, you know, there's all the data which is there. So you see already the, the big data thing uh, behind, okay? And there's also the Ebola, for example, Ebola virus, which goes through the network of the planes, you know? So everything is around this um, data analysis. So how are, you, how are you using the cloud right now? It's actually, 
we still try to figure out our policy, but from a principle, we think that you know, everything we can get from the cloud, we can still leave it in the cloud. You know? so this seems obvious, but I've seen so many times you know, people, they, they take something from the cloud, and then they put it somewhere in a vault down in the basement. You know? so, so what's the point? Uh, when we produce something in-house, we would say, okay, either it is for public use, then we put it in the cloud as a synchronization, or if it's not, like for, for some IR financial data or human resources thing for our staff, so that we would typically keep. Uh, for things we produce in-house, uh, we would say, okay, we have a simple, a simple interface where people are entering data, and we are establishing some synchronizations you know, with the cloud so that we can leverage the, the power of the cloud, meaning distributing the data to thousands of people, and on the other side, having something more like basic for the people who enter, enter data, which can be, which can be in-house. So, with EMR, I would just give you an example. Um, so Nikolai asked me to show you a little bit of what we do. And I give you an example uh, it's related to accident statistics. Okay? For aviation safety, it's basically about accidents. So if you count them, uh, you can trend them, you can calculate rates. And typically what we did until now was we did that at the end of the year. Okay? Because we took us a year to, uh, to combine all these things. Well, there are sources on the web and even our, um, we, we buy data from suppliers, which is updated daily. So we could actually, on a daily basis, provide, um, provide real-time uh, real data on accidents. So this is something we want to build. So this is our, actually a snapshot of our website where I give this as an example of an accident. So it's in uh, September, September this year in, uh, in Somalia, FOCA 50, on a, a landing accident. So this information is kind of, it's kind of unique, but then you see I have different uh, stories, or what we call narratives, and you see there are f I have four different sources. So I have four different sources telling me something about this event. Some of these sources, they tell me a little, others they tell me a lot, okay? And they would not necessarily tell me the same thing, okay? Some may say, okay, this happened in Somalia, and the other one may say, yeah, but no, it happened actually the country uh, next to it, okay? So when we combine this, so uh, when I collect this and I'm mapping it, uh, I'm mapping for my sources. Um, I have to define a key. When you will see what I'm using as a key, I'm using the date and the registration number of the plane, which is kind of, for me, the unique thing. And then I'm reducing this, and to reduce it, I have to set up priorities. And I will show you how I'm doing that. Because if I have four sources telling me something, and they don't tell me the same thing, I have to decide at one point what do I take. And there's a notion of priority. And I I'm, I'm, have put that in the reducer. And then uh, we publish this on the website, and it looks like this. So typically, I have problems with input formats. Okay? So I'm, I'm sure you have the same thing. I have some of my sources, they, they send me XML. Okay? XML, which I get like this. And other sources, they send me CSV files. Okay? So everything has to go, at the end of the day, has to go into EMR. You know? and, and EMR, they typically likes the thing when it's like the data is like line by line. Okay? And XML is not line by line. Okay? So we have to kind of pre-treat this. So we do that when we do uh, our uh, so in the collection process, I have an, uh, an EC2 instance which uh, runs some cron jobs, and uh, so every day I kind of do some wget there from my source, and uh, these wgets they so they, they get whatever the source uh, uh, provides, and uh, we have figured out that um, we need to some some processing afterwards, just these tr things. So I just wanted to show that uh, there are some trs and uh, SEDs here. This is just to have the data in line afterwards. Because as I said, EMR likes when the data is in line. And if you have an XML, you have to get rid of the line breaks. And then you have in each line, you have an one element. So at the end of this, I have something in S3, which is line by line. It can be CSV or JSON or XML. It doesn't matter, but it's, it's line by line. Um, and then I'm launching every day, once I've collected these things, I'm launching my, uh, my EMR command line. So uh, as you see, I'm using Node. Um, I'm not using R, but I'm using Node. But I, I'm kind of a JavaScript guy. I like that. So, uh, and I, I don't like learning new, uh, new things necessarily if I don't need to. Already learning EMR was not, actually not very easy. So I was happy to do that. So I was sticking to JavaScript. It works pretty fine. And, um, so I, because I, know I like JavaScript, I also like MongoDB. Uh, so I'm putting afterwards my results in MongoDB. And to do that, well, I, I need to put my key. So I also highlight this here, because that's maybe some problems you also encounter sometime. 
that your cluster cannot communicate to your servers. Well, it's because there's no key on it. So when I launch it, I'm actually putting my key. Okay. So well, that took me some time to figure out. So, but um, just showing. Uh, so this is my configuration of the uh, of the EMR, and uh, yeah, basically I'm uh, I'm just running a map a map reduce here. This is my 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 step, and then I have another step which uh, which I then have created a script which takes my result, uh, my EMR output, and puts it in my uh, my Mongo uh, database. And because I do this, I need to have the key. Okay. Um, so for the for the mapper. For the mapper, you saw that I had to define a key, and my key is not unique. I mean, I have, I'm getting a, an accident information, and it has a date, it has a models of planes, operators, a lot of stuff. But my key basically is the combination of the date and the registration number of the plane. So actually, I'm building. A, so I'm actually building a key with an. Uh, I've defined a certain rule with a uh, with a hash in the middle. So that becomes that becomes my key, and. Um, when I'm mapping, I'm actually all interested. Let's say here's an example where I'm taking the date, the date, the registration number, the model of the plane, the source. So which source is it? One of my four sources, and then the priority I have given to that source. Okay, and so I have built my data, and I'm uh, I'm doing my output. So I'm using the key plus an, uh, a stringified uh, JSON of this uh, of this element. So in this mapper here, I I have actually per source I have a function. So if it's XML, it takes the source uh, mapper of uh, the XML thing. If it's a CSV, it takes the CSV, and uh, so that's actually in the in the mapper. So after that, I have my things mapped. So I have I got rid of my XML, my CSV, my JSON. I have everything now, and a key, and then plus a JSON stringified. And of course, that EMR what takes this and sorts it. And then sends it back to my to my reducer. Well, my reducer it's actually not a very straightforward thing, okay? Because normally you could say, okay, I have my keys, and then they are. If it's the same key, um, then I'm just uh, I'm just reducing it, you know. Or, but here it's a little bit different because I have the different priorities inside, you know. So I have to collect uh, everything which is the same key, meaning the same plane and date. So I maybe have four, like I have four sources. Maybe each of one gives tells me something. So I have four things. So I'm just collecting them in the reducer. I'm putting them in an array. And once I have, uh, I have everything, like the, the, um, the key has changed. So I have everything. Then I'm kind of sorting this. Sorting is by priority. So I'm getting priority one, two, three, four in that order. And then I'm filling up, uh, I'm filling up my, um, my, let's say, my combined result. Okay, so it's actually my source number one, which will take ownership of um, maybe this, the date or the state of state of uh, registry. If the source number one gives me that, it will be taken. The other ones, they will be in yours. So that's that's why it has to be a little bit different. So I'm using this priority and, and sorting inside. So how how do I do this at the end of the day? Well, I have my EC tools. Which then, uh, getting my data from from the web or different places, it puts in S3. Uh, I'm running my EMR. I have my result uh, in in MongoDB, and I have written an, uh, again with Node, uh, written a web server, and uh, the web server then uh, provides um, these kind of examples. Uh, so, the last uh, the, the last one is typically an accident, a daily accident rate chart. Which we were able to generate. So every day, we are able to give the number of accidents we had this year with a projection to the end of the year, and we can compare to last year. And we are able to to give indicators like if it's getting better or if it's getting better or worse compared to last year, like this ones. So these are real time real time statistics. So this is just an example of uh, of other processes. Uh, other processes we have. This is, for example, audit results. We'll be doing the same thing. We have uh, audit results which are stored somewhere. Safety audits, where we are going and auditing the whole world. And this is a view of a uh, safety audit of a country. Um, this is the same thing we would do with traffic information. This is like uh, uh, flights going from a country to another country. And this is, for example, the same thing. 
on uh, looking at data we're getting from another source on, uh, maybe you know Flight Radar 24 or Radar Box 24. It's where you see live planes flying, uh, flying around. So you can connect actually to that data. And, and we also do that in the same way, uh, same way like here. So we put it in an EMR and then the result in this case is a uh, flow, like this is the airport of, uh, of London Heathrow uh, over 48 hours. So it's uh, tracks from planes. You see that they, they're coming from different directions. And what we are looking at is if there are some sort of um, nodes like this, you know, it's like holding patterns. So that's what we're looking, looking for. So again, this is kind of almost real-time real -time things we can, we can do. And it's clear that without, without the cloud and without EMR, we would not be able to, to, to process, uh, process these things, you know. And um, so this is for us really just, uh, just the beginning the beginning of um, our journey here, you know. So um, I, I give the floor back to, to Nikolai. Please join me in congratulating. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. In congratulating Marco in, the, in this uh, terrific and uh, uh, long-reaching research into aviation safety by leveraging AWS tools. Uh, in closure, I just would like to highlight uh, our big data blog, just Google it uh, or search it online uh, with any engine you like, uh, AWS data blog, and a lot of actionable, uh, very detailed technical information which you can put to use, and certainly welcome your submissions to this blog uh, to share with the big data community. I would like to highlight also a couple of the presentations here at reInvent. Uh, they're already passed. Uh, we're one of the uh, uh, later sessions. Uh, so please check out uh, the materials later online, uh, both SlideShare and YouTube. And uh, uh, you can launch an application. You can see how to do that uh, in the Big Data 205. Uh, you can see the lessons learned uh, both from Cloudera and EMR in uh, Big Data 305. And then last but not least, uh, best practices at, Net at Netflix. We all can learn from that. Uh, so with that, I would like to conclude and thank you. And uh, please give us your feedback. We look forward to it. Uh, Big Data 302. Thank you. Thanks.